Coming up on Theater Talk. Today, it's Broadway making its reputation by capitalizing on films. Right. And it used to be totally the other way around. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. My favorite television show, without a doubt, is Robert Osborne's great movies on Turner Classic Movies. I'd never miss it. You could, this is the kind of thing you can turn on television, and whatever movie show, and you drop everything to watch to that end of the movie. Yeah. I'm very delighted to have Robert Osborne with us today on Thank Theater you. Talk, who's going to talk about some of the great movies about the theater and right. some of the great plays that became great right. movies. Right, right. Welcome to welcome Thank to Thank you. Talk, it's so nice to be here. Yes. so nice to be here. Um, all right, Robert. Uh, what do you think is the greatest movie about Broadway, about the theater? That's fast. I can answer that quickly. Don't really have to think about that. All about Eve. Of course. Yeah. That's I think it's. One. I think it's. Uh, I think it's one of the great movies ever made. I don't think there's a line of dialogue that doesn't work mm -hmm. and that doesn't also advance the plot. I think the performances are great. I think it's perfectly cast. I mean, there are people like Hugh Marlowe and uh, Gary Merrill that I think never fit anything like they fit the roles they had in that movie. They were playing the playwright and the, the playwright and director. the and the director. Yeah. There's a kind of a theatricality about Gary Merrill that never fit other parts mm. so well, but playing a director in the theater, that, you know, mm -hmm. he could allow all of that. Betty Davis, sublime mm -hmm. in, a, in a part. Celeste Holm is absolutely- Never been better, really. Never been better than is this playwright's wife. Yeah. And Baxter's wonderful George Sanders. It's like he spent his whole life oh. Auditioning <laughs> for, for that part. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn you know. Monroe, who steals the scene out from under yeah. Betty Davis yeah. and Celeste Holman, George Sanders, just yeah. sitting on the stairs in the, in the party scene. But I think, it's, I think it's really one of the great films of mm -hmm. all time about the theater, because it also says a lot about the theater, about ambition, and about uh, the love of the theater, and about aging in the theater. It, it covers all bases. And about the people who are in the theater who have no life outside of the theater. Yes. You know, I think it's George Sanders in the movie who says, I live like a Trappist monk. Yeah. Everything is exactly. theater to me. Exactly. And Celeste Holm being part of the supporting cast in the theater. I mean, she's a playwright's wife. She doesn't have anything to do right. with the theater except she, you know, uh, helps these people and builds them up and all of that. I think it's a great movie. I was always interested in George Sanders, and I read somewhere, and I wonder if this is true, that that <clears throat> sort of, oh, kind of cool elegance that he had in the movie came about because he was always taking naps between takes so that he would come on and he would be just kind of waking up out of a nap and that's why he looked like that could have been except i have to tell you about george sanders there are two women who i i shall not name <laughs> both actresses one told me this like in the 1960s the other one told me this like in 2000 uh this decade uh when i asked them if they had ever they were both married ladies mm -hmm. throughout most of their lives and I asked them both if they ever uh, fell in love with one of the leading men or was ever attracted to a leading man. And both of them, and this was what struck me so much, both of them said in different ways, but they both said basically, well, yeah, there was, there was one I was seriously thinking about maybe leaving my husband for. Hmm. And uh, two, as a matter of fact. And I said, well, who is that? And said, well, John Hodiak yeah. and George Sanders. Really? Thought, isn't that interesting? How interesting. Isn't that? And then years later, this other actress, I asked the same question, and she said the same two people, John Hodiak and George Sanders. So whatever George did, naps or otherwise, <laughs> he had something going for him. And yet here, here was a man who killed himself saying, I'm, I'm bored. bored. Yes. Is that true? I, I, yes, that's he not did. A poc he left I, a note. If you can just tell us what happened. That he well, he, uh, he uh, I think it was in Spain or something uh -huh. where he was. But of course, he was also married to two Gabors. So yes, that, yes. That, that, <laughs> that's enough that's to drive something. you. <laughs> that might drive you to something. Uh, I'm curious about Joe Mankiewicz, who wrote All About Eve. Um, and directed it. And directed mm -hmm. it as well. Uh, I'm friendly with his uh, widow, Rosemary Mankiewicz, mm -hmm. and I've had the great pleasure of being up at her house and holding the Oscar that he won for All About Eve in my hands. But um, Rosemary said, and I wonder if you would agree with this, that toward the end of his career, he realized that there was no interest in literary scripts anymore mm -hmm. that people complained in Hollywood that his scripts had too much dialogue in them mm -hmm. 
And that's kind of why that career sort of petered out. Well, I think it did. You know, he was a great producer as well. He produced, for instance, Woman of the Year, the first right. Hepburn Tracy movie that George right. uh, Stevens directed. But he, you know, he was very literate and he was a very bright man. And uh, he did, uh, you know, in 1949, did A Letter to Three Wives yeah. and won the great Oscars, movie, director yeah. and screenwriter. And the next year, won two Oscars, director and screenwriter for All About Eve. And then he did a wonderful movie called Five Fingers in yes. 1951 with James, James Mason. James Mason as the uh, valet who's the thief in the embassy right. in Berlin, I yeah, think, or right. in England. Great right. espionage thriller. Yeah. Yeah. And then then came interesting things that were not quite as successful, like Barefoot Contessa. Yeah. You know, he did mm -hmm. uh, Cleopatra, which is uh, was kind of considered a failure, but it's really not a bad movie. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's spectacularly good. Rex Harrison is very good as Caesar. Rex Harrison is yeah. great. Uh, but it caught, got caught up in so much notoriety. But I always felt that what he really had to say as a writer and director, he said in Letter to Three Wives and All About Eve, mm -hmm. that, that it's like he had so much to say about the theater mm -hmm. and all of that mm -hmm. and about the uh, radio, which is a major topic of, of uh, Letter to Three Wives. Yeah, right. Slams right. at radio and everything. And Southern plays a radio writer. And it's, it's kind of a satire about that as well. Uh, that I think also... Not only was the industry changing, so they didn't want the literate script so much anymore, but also I think what he had to say, he really got said mm. in those two movies. And I think that happens to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, you're very passionate about something, and if you have a place to say it, and you say it so well, right. you know, where do you go from there? A few other movies about the theater that people may not know as well as All About E that, uh, that you like and might call attention to? Well, uh, there are a lot about the theater and about theater people. The, the, the problem is that so often I don't think that they're really a, a great... Uh, I, don't th I don't think the subject really gets to be about the theater, more about theater people. I mean, there have been a lot like... Uh, the, the the Velvet Touch with Rosalind Russell is all about the theater and an actress who, you know, kills somebody mm. accidentally, a critic, and, <laughs> and all of that. Maybe not so accidentally. <laughs> uh, but you know, they they were all uh, kind of vehicles for actors and actresses and all of that, and not not so wise and not so realistic as I think all about it. And is. what a shame that they messed up Gypsy by putting Rosalind Russell in it. Well, and yes. making a not good movie about the theater, from yeah. a wonderful musical about yeah. the theater. Yeah, a lot of people like that, uh, and I can understand why they did. You know, because uh, Ethel Merman was very big for the screen, and she I hadn't know, she hadn't drawn people to see "Call Me Madam" when that was made into yeah, a movie. Or but still, what no a business. mistake. Yes, but you know, you have to realize that is a business, and mm -hmm. uh, and what I I give credit more or or uh, anger more at say Mervyn Leroy for his direction of Gypsy and all of that. I think that Rosalind Russell is a terribly talented lady. You, there's no performance maybe better in comedy than Rosalind Russell and Auntie Mame. Yeah. Oh, she can do wonderful all, things. And I think that, that uh, at that same time, Mervyn Leroy uh, pretty much messed up Mary Mary that he directed uh, with the two stars. Debbie and, Reynolds. Yeah. And Debbie Reynolds taking yeah. over for Barbara Bogetti's, yeah, and that's yeah. a disaster. Yeah, it is. Debbie's wonderful in it, but the two guys from the Broadway show yeah. are still doing, Barry Nelson and Michael Rennie yeah. are still doing stage performances, yeah. and it's the director that mm -hmm. should do that. Yeah. If you want to see a really bad translation, see the Bad Seed with Nancy Kelly. Oh, she got oh an Oscar nomination, <laughs> but that's, a, that's an embarrassingly bad performance. But She's that's doing like Grand Guignol, that Bad Seed movie. It's so, yeah, but, it's so bad, it's good. Yeah, well, yeah it, but it is, but it could have been a good movie yeah, yeah. If, it had been, if they'd been directed better yes, yes. and brought down to a motion picture level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and Mervyn Roy was an old timer, and he yeah. knew better than that. So I blame him. I don't blame yeah. the actors ever. One of the things I'm struck by when I'm watching Turner Classic movies um, is how often the movies you show began as stage plays back in the yes. day, and how oh. important the theater writers were at one point so to important. Hollywood. All these great Can you writers. Give us a little history of how that came yeah, about and why it ended. It always used to be. You know, if you look back, uh, I love the old theater directories and old New York Times and papers when you you know can see things are running or back of old theater arts magazines yep. or yep. something. And you never saw a revival on Broadway. I mean, they just uh, simply didn't revive shows on Broadway. Broadway was always the place where a writer went to really establish themselves. Mm -hmm. If you really want to be taken seriously as a writer, you know, you first did a Broadway play. Right. And then it went, to, then the movies jumped and, and picked it up and it became a movie. And now it's kind of quite the opposite. You look today and you've got like, uh, I think there's seven I counted shows today yeah, on Broadway that started out as movies. Yeah. You know, even yeah. A Little Night Music was Smiles of a Summer Night. Right. Before it became a That's movie. That's a big change. Yeah. And you go back, and you got The Lion King, and you got all these others. 
And, and today, it's Broadway making its reputation by capitalizing on films. Right. And it used to be totally the other way around. I think that one of the things that happened was the fact that once television came in, you didn't have to write the Philadelphia story to make your name. Right. You could make a good living in television without having made that or written that great play. Mm. And I think that's kind of sad because I think it, it hasn't allowed some of the people to be pushed to the, what their best writing instincts would be. The image one has of the New York playwright going to Hollywood, like a Clifford Odets or mm -hmm. someone like that, is <clears throat> they get out there and in some ways they're artistically ruined by the, by the studio. By the money. By yes. the money and yes. the studio process. Is that, a, is that just a cliche? Is that a fair No, I think that's kind of fair. I think that's kind of fair. The, the playwrights in New York were used to having more freedom. Yep. Mm -hmm. They could kind of say what they wanted to yep. do, more control. And out there they, they did have to, and, you know, and the different studios treated them in different ways. You know, the famous story, I think it was William Faulkner was writing a screenplay in California, and he couldn't write at the studio because they wanted him actually in a room writing eight <laughs> hours a day. Yeah. And that's not the way he wrote. He said, well, you know, I'd like, could I write from home? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and they thought, well, you know, he's staying over at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Yeah, that, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So you could stay home. Well, they tried again the next day, and days after, they couldn't reach him. Well, he'd gone home. Oh. Back east. <laughs> oh, you know? really? Yes, he really went home. <laughs> but but the, so... But they loved the mo the money. But uh, you know, at that time, also you had John Steinbeck writing for movies. He wrote yeah. Lifeboat, you right, know, for right. Hitchcock, oh, right. yeah, and you had right. yeah. you had these William Faulkner, and you had uh, Raymond Chandler. Fitzgerald these... didn't do very well, though. No, he didn't. But of course, he wasn't doing too well yes, anywhere. It was the drinking, not Hollywood, that got him. Now, according to Lillian Hellman, who many say was a big liar, but uh, she said that uh, Chris Clifford Odette said said to her. You don't understand what it is to have to pay for a swimming pool. Yeah, as a justification <laughs> uh -huh. for selling out for the money. Yeah, but you know that's very seductive. But you get a lot of people that you know actors as well today yeah. go out to California and they they lead different lives. It's a different culture out there and all of that. Mm -hmm. And you then you got those that are smart enough to kind of stay in New York because I think it does keep you a little more yeah. based. Can you give us a couple of uh, movies that you feel are really the best adaptations of a stage play that are worth seeing perhaps because they've kept the cast that was originally there or they've just, you know, captured the spirit of the Well, play. I certainly think Philadelphia Story is a great adaptation of the stage right. play. It, you never Philip feel, Berry play. Yeah. Philip Berry, you never feel cramped by it. You yeah. never feel it was uh, right. done on the stage because it's opened up. Also, the fact, I also give Katherine Hepburn great credit because she did it on the stage very successfully and she could adapt to to movie technique, mm -hmm. and she did wonderfully, because I'm sure the performance is different than all, it was on the stage. Mm -hmm. I think Picnic was opened up very well yeah. for the movie compared sure. to the stage play. I think two great examples, well, maybe the greatest example of it being, well, two, I'd say, better better in the movies than on the stage would be Sound of Music mm -hmm. to take advantage of the the actual scenery, Austrian mm -hmm. scenery and all of that, and also The King and I, because that was done yeah. on a lavish scale that gave you the kind of this this feeling of a kingdom and all of that. And I've seen that on the stage many times, and it's very impressive, but not as impressive. It's, as it, 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 it's only a shame that they had to have Marnie Nixon in there doing the voiceover. Yeah, except I thought they did that so well in it, it, that, indeed, because indeed. it is a lot of Deborah Carr's voice, and you're never as, you're never as stunned that it's Marnie Nixon yeah. as you are with Audrey Hepburn and My Fair Lady. These you know, yeah. that's so obviously yeah. not. But And I've seen the, uh, been sent a, ch uh, somebody got the, Audrey Hepburn track where she did sing the songs because oh, she wanted goodness. to sing it and put it on because she actually mouthed it you know uh -huh. and sang it really? to the thing and uh, they sent me this copy of the movie yeah. with her track on uh -huh. instead of Marnie Nixon's and she, she had an okay voice but it wasn't melodic enough for it mm -hmm. I mean she really couldn't sing it that well but of course there was a movie not to be confused with the wonderful King and I the 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 uh, my fair lady where I felt Audrey Hepburn was such a Hollywood choice I mean that yes. never was that person a flower girl no and that to she me ruined the you whole know movie. Audrey Hepburn is so, yeah. such a uh, was such a such a glamorous but a, a great presence, yes, you know, the, we the, loved Audrey Hepburn, didn't but, buy it, yeah. but they had a huge investment in that. Warner Brothers had mm -hmm, a huge mm -hmm. investment. Audrey Hepburn had done Wait Until Dark for them, and it made mm -hmm. a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Julie Andrews was not known mm -hmm. outside of theater circles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Rex Harrison, you know, hadn't, he was just kind of newly back mm -hmm. in films after he was kind of exiled from films mm -hmm. for several years. And uh, 
so they had a huge investment and you know they would have done well in the big cities but you in those days you had to think of what it was going to make in uh, Colfax Washington and then you know a little town outside of Denver I know, Colorado but it's it's this corporate thinking where that you know if, if the casting makes no sense they don't care I mean you know, yes. you're right well I you think know, they do well, more now yeah. I mean they would go more now we see examples of that in yeah. movies now of casting you know you get a movie like uh an education with Peter Skarsgård mm -hmm. and Carrie mm -hmm. Mulligan mm -hmm. and uh, Alfred Molina and stuff. You know, it's absolutely wonderful. And somebody went with that. Yes, they yes. didn't insist on having uh, you know Brad Pitt and Angelina exactly, Jolie exactly. in it. But uh, in those days where they had theaters and they had these big investments and they right. had stockholders that they really worried right. about, they they had to think of the box office. And, or you have I to think get... Audrey is a bad choice for me because the fact that, as you said. She was wonderful in the transition, but I could never believe that she would be, you know, a flower girl. Never. Yeah. There was something Even so classy. Even with that classy, little no. charcoal makeup but on, making I, it look a little I have the same objection to Breakfast at Tiffany's with her, and everybody loves her in that movie, but I could never believe that she'd be a so dizzy. A bear dog patch kind of girl. No, or that she would, in her refrigerator, only have an orchid and a bottle of champagne. Yeah. She's too sensible for that. Audrey Hepburn would have <laughs> well, some cottage she cheese very in there. Much. <laughs> you know. Now, if you had to give out a turkey to the worst movie of a stage production, what would that be? Well, I would certainly put, I'd certainly put uh, uh, Chorus Line yep. right up there yeah. because that was such a great musical. And that brings up a whole other thing. Uh, you get, uh, where they ever started casting directors in some of these movies, you've right. got John Huston, who is so great at yeah. doing the Treasure of Sierra Madre and these kind of lusty, yeah. very masculine kind of stories directing the story about a little sweet little girl Annie yeah which was a kids. colossal I failure mean, give me a break <laughs> you know he and Richard an old... Attenborough this Brit yes. yeah. you know had never done a musical before doing that it worked a couple of times it certainly worked with Oliver with uh, Sir that? Carol Reed yeah. right directed right. that right. you know you think of him as the third man and yeah yeah and uh, Fallen Idol and stuff he did a wonderful job on that and William Wyler did a wonderful job on Funny Girl mm. you mm -hmm. know yeah. Uh, that's quite exceptional. Yeah. He'd never done a yeah. musical. But then these others, you know, and there's so many of them. But how did Houston get Annie? How did that? I have no idea. Somebody went insane. You know, they, <laughs> you know, too many drugs on the table. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. again, the, it, this goes back to the whole culture of the motion picture business. But there was a time that all those people running studios were showmen, and they really understood it. Yeah. They understood how to get people into a theater. How to leave them with a, even if it's a very serious story like A Grapes of Wrath, with a positive message. So when people leave the theater, they want to go back in next week. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as depressing as the story in The Grapes of Wrath is, it, you come out thinking it's about family and it's about sticking together and surviving. And yes, we can do it. And you do that, all of that stuff. And they knew, they knew the psychology of all of that. And so uh, they would make decisions based on that more than they do now. Now and you have people get, running yeah. studios who've never made a movie, mm. that are money men, yeah. that are put in those positions. But back in those days, I think the only one that had never produced a movie back in those days, because Daryl Zanuck certainly produced yeah. movies, mm -hmm. Jack Warner produced movies, Harry Cohen at Columbia Pictures produced movies, is I think the only one, and Buddy De Silva was running Paramount for a long time, he's a great Broadway producer. But it was uh, Louis V. Mayer, but he had Irving Thalberg, yes, who was a producer. Right. one of the greatest producers so of all time. So he didn't have to be producing; he, somebody else there. So, but today that doesn't exist. So you're getting these strange decisions strange being decisions made, and, and everybody's told. But, but even you think, whose decision was it to put Barbara Streisand in Hello Dolly? Yes, well, uh, again, you know. Yeah, exactly. But, but that being a few years back, but but now of course we're told the decisions are all made by you know sixteen year olds. Basically, or yes, who probably studios. yes, yeah. who probably had never seen Carol Channing and didn't know yeah, that. Didn't but know if him. not Carol Channing, certainly Lucille Ball could have done Hello Dolly well, at that point. Mm -hmm. no, but she, I don't know. We saw Mame. Well, but Mame. The problem with Mame was, is the fact that she was playing a part that we'd seen done perfectly before, yeah, and yeah. she was trying to do it different way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I never forget a uh, an article that came out that that because uh, I knew I, Lucio Ball was actually my first boss in California oh, really? uh, when I was an actor, oh, yes. Oh, really? And uh, well, you worked for Desilu I, Productions? I did, and I got to know her very well. Yeah. And around that Desilu time, um, after the Desilu time, when she was t talking about MAME, she was very desperate to do that. She wanted to do a movie particularly with uh, uh, B. Arthur, mm -hmm. and she was very keen to do it. But an article came out after the movie in which she said, 
that she had only agreed to do it after she found out Angela Lansbury had no interest in doing it, blah, 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 which was totally not true. Yes. But anyway, <laughs> so somebody took that to Miss Lansbury who said, no, that's not true. She said, I want to do it in the worst way possible, yeah. but I didn't get a chance. And so somebody wrote in the next day to the LA Times and said, isn't it interesting that Angela Lansbury said that she wanted to do Mame in the worst way possible because that's exactly how Lucille Ball did it. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, but she was also, you know, she Lucy tried to do different line readings. Yeah. But Rosalind Russell's line readings and Angela Lansbury's were the right way. Did you knew Lucy well? Did did she ever acknowledge that Mame was not a good movie? No. Really? No, she never did. And she was I think that was a heartbreak that she took with her to the end oh, of her life. Really? She you know, Lucy came from a culture where movies were the important thing. Mm -hmm. And in California, they still kind of are. Yeah. You know, you can be the biggest success on television, but you're not thought of in a, in a culture quite with a movie a star. Movie star. Right. And she grew right. up in that, and as famous as she was in television, she never really thought that had the value mm -hmm. of, of movies. or not. It didn't have the status of movies. So I think with Mame, she thought not only was she going to really become a, a great movie star at last, but also perhaps won an Academy Award for it. Mm -hmm. And I think it came as a total shock to her. And nobody had ever turned on her before. Really? You know, critics had always loved everything she'd done on television. Who directed that? Uh, Gene Sachs? Gene Sachs. Yeah. Be, because Be Arthur's you, what, husband. What did sense watching this that no one said, no, Lucy, that's not a very good take. You didn't do that with Lucy you at could, that point. That, well, there, yeah. there. And you no, could. Lucy, why don't we try it with two filters on you, not 12? You know, and she couldn't sing. It was so many things where obviously you couldn't say yes, no to her. But that's where the power corrupts after yeah. a while. Lucy had become so, so successful and did her job so well mm -hmm. that she, and maybe rightly so, felt she knew yeah. more than anybody on how to package Lucille Ball. I think if an Orson Welles had come along, because she was always in awe mm -hmm. of him, mm -hmm. that, or uh, some really strong director, she would have listened. But That'd have been great. Gene Sachs John was, Huston. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I do want to put in a good word for Lucy, though, in one movie. I think I saw it on TCM. A really interesting movie called The Facts of Life with Lucille yes, Ball and Bob Yes, it's wonderful. Hope. It's a wonderful yeah, movie. Yeah, and kind of serious. Yep, yeah. About two uh, middle-aged people who are trying to have an affair. Yep, that's right. Uh, but it's a really wonderful movie. Yeah, and that, I, was, uh, that was made at a very tough time in her life, because that was when, right when she realized that her marriage to Desi was over. Uh -huh. And I used to be on the set of that a lot, and she cried a lot uh, during that movie. Uh -huh. And Ruth Hussey, who played uh, uh, Bob Hope's wife in the movie, I'll always be grateful to her, because she was always taking care of Lucy and helping right. her get right. through all of that. But uh, also another great Lucille Ball performance is in a movie called The Big Street, about Broadway. Oh, really? I don't uh, know Damon Runyon's story with Henry Fonda that she did. Huh. I'm going to write that the down, The Big Street. Yeah, write The Big Street. Down. It's a great performance. Mm. And she's absolutely wonderful in it. It's a very, uh, very uh, crafty showgirl who becomes kind of a nightclub star and uh, won't have anything to do with this guy who's a waiter in the restaurant, Henry Fonda. So but this then is from she, the 40s, right? 1941, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Mm. And uh, 42. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she has a terrible accident and everybody abandons her except the waiter. Hmm. Six. And it's a, such a sweet oh, story, and she's wonder, absolutely wonderful. Anna. Excellent. So you, you know, know we're, dead, we're, we're we're running out of time. You've got all the stuff at your fingertips. So when I <laughs> so when I see you on TCM, there, you know, do you write a script or you just go in there and you just no? Have I it write all a, here? I write a script because you know I have to. I go down to Atlanta for a week once yeah. a month and do 150 and oh, throw an exit. Goodness. So I couldn't uh, like Keep it all, yeah. do it like that. Yeah. So I do have a bit of a structure to it. But yeah, yeah I do kind of have have it at my fingertips. It's something that's always fascinated me, and I, I love these movies. I also love TCM and the fact that they're now out there for us to see, because there were many years that you couldn't... They were in know, a vault, you, right? No, yeah. yeah. You'd see it maybe in a, at the uh, Million Dollar Movie or something like that with all the musical numbers cut out yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And at least you're seeing them now without cuts, without interruptions, as they were meant to be seen. And I'm I'm thrilled we have them back again. Yeah. It's marvelous. And you find the, the audience is uh, uh, younger for TCM? Are you introducing a whole generation to yeah, these great movies? Yeah, it's really kind of wonderful when we go to the, have these screenings and, and kids come up to you. And so many kids are being introduced to that. And I think it's also because kids are not being given a lot of variety in what they see in movies today. Mm -hmm. And they kind of well, want that's more. That's for sure. I mean, as I wanted more when I was that age, you know? Yeah. And they really respond to that kind of stuff. And they respond to these people like a John Garfield or a, you know, a, a Robert Taylor, a yeah. Ava Gardner, some of these people they've never heard of before, Rita Hayworth, you know. And whatever it is they had, 
is kind of universal. Right. You know? They still have that charisma. They still yeah, have that star absolutely. power. I had a kid uh, at the Hollywood Reporter call me. He's about 26 years old not too long ago. And he said, you know, I saw this movie last night. And it was really great. And this beautiful woman was in that. And I wanted to know if she ever made any other films. And I said, well, what was the name of the movie? He said, well, I, I, never, I didn't get the name of it. He said, uh, so I said, well, describe it. It turned out it was Gilda with Rita Hayworth. And I thought, <laughs> I thought isn't that great that, that, you know, without any publicity from Harry Cohen and Columbia Pictures, right. he responded the way right. people did, you know, yeah. in 1946. Yeah. And it's all these years later. Fantastic. And too bad she's not around to know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep showing all about Eve on TCA. Okay, I'll do that. So I'll do please, that. please come back. I love your enthusiasm. Thank please you. come back. Please I come would back. love to do You're that. welcome at any time. Robert Thank Osborne you. from Turner Classic Movies. We know he's a theater man, too, because he used to be a theater critic. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. And I love the theater. Very much so. All right. Thanks for being our guest tonight. Thank you. Talk. Pleasure. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>